a playlist original. Hey everyone, Jeff here from Films at Home. Thanks for coming back to the podcast today. Uh, in this episode, we're going to be talking to Adam Hlavik. Adam is one of the members of Heroes Reforged. It's a YouTube channel that is heavily involved with like movie reactions and movie reviews and very involved in the movie community. And Adam is also a big collector of physical media, a huge supporter of physical media. He's all over the internet on Twitter, on Instagram, you know, you'll see him on YouTube. He does a ton of work in content creation and reviewing movies, but he has this real passion for physical media. So I wanted to talk to him about that. The other cool thing is that he's actually worked on 3D restorations uh, in the past. And that was a, a really interesting thing that you know, I didn't expect to get into. I didn't know that about him going into the podcast, but turns out he's worked on some really cool projects. And so we talk a little bit about 3D Blu-ray and that format and maybe the future of 3D and where that's headed and how those restorations, you know, take place, how they work. So it was a really, really good conversation. I, I loved having him on. We'll definitely have to have him back because I had a lot of fun talking to him just about a lot of different topics and he's a really cool guy. So I think you guys will enjoy this episode. Um, at the end, I'll come back with a with a little outro, give you some details on uh, what's coming next week. But for now, sit back, relax, enjoy the interview, and I'll talk to you guys at the end. All right, everyone. So here's our interview today. We've got Adam Hlavik um, joining us, which you were highly requested on Twitter, I'll say, when I said, <laughs> hey, you know, I'm looking for guests for season two. Who should I go get? Your, your name came up quite a few times, so I appreciate Good. you you coming on and, and taking the time yeah for sure i mean i'm glad because i um i mean i'm sure you know this as a, as a lover of physical media you know you always try to make your voice heard in that space because yeah. you want people to who are also enthusiastic about it to find you so anytime i i i get something new or you know i buy something i always try to make a point to put it out there that like hey i'm excited about this thing physical media physical media physical media so I'm glad that um, my followers, you know, came out and and vouched for me because otherwise I'm like, oh, I'm doing this all wrong. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah, no. And I, I had I'd seen your stuff and, uh, you know, I've been following for a while. And yeah, they just I was like, yeah, this, this is a no brainer. Why haven't I, <laughs> why haven't I already talked to him? Um, but yeah, it came up quite a few times. So clearly, whatever, you're, Good. whatever you're doing out there, it's working, which <laughs> well, I appreciate. Well, and it's funny too because you know <clears throat> you you straight up like do deep dives on a lot of these Blu-rays. I haven't really had an opportunity to do that yet, mostly because you know we have our YouTube channel, which yep. that is a whole job in and of itself. Um, obviously, like we're not even on, we're not really doing much on TikTok, so it's like that has become such a full-time sort of commitment. Yep. Um, but at, at the very mm -hmm. least, to just be able to take a photograph or do a little video of like here's my haul for the week or whatever the case may be. Um, but I definitely would like to do more in depth stuff in the future. It's just always carving out the time is really, really tough. I'm sure you know this with how many, not only new movies that are coming out, you know, on 4k or Blu-ray, but also so many, um, like classics from the libraries that are coming out and being remastered. There's so much stuff. Yeah. Especially recently for, for I don't know what it is, but the last three or four months, it's been like it's been insane. Stop! Yeah, I mean, I I have stuff from three months ago that I'm still like I've got to get on and make a video about this and yeah. sit down and watch these because you know now everything's ramped up post COVID too, where there's there's now the theatrical releases. So like right. at least the last couple of years, it was like okay, a lot of back catalog stuff, and I could keep up. Now it's mm -hmm. all of that times two. Yeah, because everything that's coming out in theaters, all the new releases. Yeah, so. I'm sure you're in the same boat as me. Like Warner Brothers just sent out a pack of, I think it's four films: Christmas Vacation, Christmas, Polar Express, yeah. Elf, and A Christmas Story. And like, I, I I have not watched any of them yet because I have all these other ones that I've, like I just got the shout remasters of the Halloween films. So I'm like slowly making my way through, and I'm like, God, for people who are making content about this stuff full time. Or, or at least like that's their primary focus. It's an amazing time to be that type of creator 
but it was also incredibly tough. I would imagine to just keep up with it. Like you're saying to, you know, do let's say there's 10 titles a week that come out. That's so hard to cover in just seven days. Like the amount of content you have to record all the research you have to do just watching the movies. I can't even imagine how tough it is to keep up. Yeah. I mean, that is, well, I get a lot of messages from people and they're like, Hey, I'm not going to buy this until you review it. And I'm like, well, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> maybe like find another review, read somebody else's because we all sort of have to work together to cover this stuff because it right. is, like, yeah, I got those. Like, that's the crazy thing is like a few years ago, Warner brothers might've given you like elf on 4k. And like, mm-hmm. that's all that would have came out. And now they're like, we're dropping every one of our Christmas movies at the same time. So it's crazy. And they just did Casablanca like a week before that. Right. So I, I literally just finished Casablanca, watched it, recorded that review. And then that day, the mm-hmm. package from Warner Brothers showed up. So I've watched National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. It's the only one of the four that I've had a chance to watch yet. Because um, I had I have to kill a mockingbird, which I just finished up. I had the Texas Chainsaw Massacre mm-hmm. 2, which just came out from Vinegar. It's in all these boutique labels. It's every week there's something yeah. new. I mean, I... I can't even scratch the surface on everything Kino Lorber's doing, Shout Factory's doing. All the sales that they keep having, and I'm like, one, you're after my wallet, two, you're after my time. So I guess you're doing your job well. (laughs) Yeah, and I I just saw, I think, um, the Media Play News put out their latest statistic for for last week on, like, market share. And, like, 4K had, like, 25% of the market share, which is the highest I think I've ever seen, where – DVD had dipped to like 40% and Blu-ray had the other 35. So they're almost yeah. at level. It's like really, yeah. it's really starting to come around, which is interesting because it's taken yes. <laughs> six, seven years for that format. Like for sure. Blu-ray, Blu-ray and DVD did not take that long to just swing around and become the, you know, the mainstream thing. But I think right. a lot of people with you're getting PS fives and new Xboxes and they have, you know, there's built in players and you can't go and buy anything but a 4k TV. So it's like mm-hmm. <clears throat> slowly, slowly people are coming around to it, but it is yeah. a great time. It's a great time to be a collector for sure. So what's, um, what are some of the ones you've, you've gone through lately? You mentioned the Halloween, you're talking the new Halloween six to eight, right? Yeah. So I've, I've, I've got those. Yeah. Got those right here, actually. There you go. <laughs> um yeah i've got i've got that then i've got the new those new titles from warner brothers what else do i have i uh scream has been doing new remasters as well paramount's been doing those Mm -hmm. so i have scream scream 2 i'm slowly just like i try to or lost boys also came out and what was the other one lost boys and something else that was part of yeah that was part of their like little horror their (laughs) horror month stuff um yeah, so those are the ones that I've been trying to focus on. That was kind of my my main focus during October, at least, was to try to get through as much 4K stuff of you know that's kind of like on theme. Um, so I think that's probably been taking up the most of my time. But then I've also been going back and I've been rewatching stuff like Gemini Man and Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit movies. So it's kind of a it's a little bit all over the place, and it's like a mix of new stuff and old stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of primarily where my focus has been on. It also kind of is dependent upon what is coming out in the future. So if I know a new movie from a certain franchise or a sequel is coming out, I'll go back and I'll rewatch. If they have a 4K remaster, I'll prioritize either getting it or if I already have it, I'll try to watch that. So, yeah, it's kind of been a mix of stuff, not really any one particular genre or franchise. It's kind of everywhere at this point. Yeah, you know, I'm with you. I did the same thing in October. I was pretty, and, and people kind of, <laughs> there's people on YouTube. I like horror movies anyway. That's my, of course, that Come is on. my go to. So when October rolled around and we just got dumped on with 4K horror movies, I mean, mm-hmm. I went Universal Classics Monsters movies that came out, <clears throat> the um, Amityville Horror, the Halloween movies, Lost Boys, Poltergeist. I was like doing like horror nonstop for a month. Yeah. I had like people in the comments, like do something else. I'm like, this is- <laughs> no, it's <laughs> October. You fools. Yeah. First of all, no. And second of all, this is what's coming out. This yeah. Is just, these things are timed on purpose for October. I promise right. you, we'll get some Christmas movies in the next couple months. I knew they were coming. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it, October was a, was a crazy good month. 
for I really I, I really want to dip into that universal um box set that they have in 4K. The only thing that's holding me back is that the Blu-ray, the HD version, has a 3D Blu-ray of Creature from the Black Lagoon. And I, I'm one of those people. I still actually have a 3D TV. Uh, it's a 3D 4K TV. It's like from 2016. It's one of the last and only yeah. LG models that they made that has 4K and 3D built in. But that's the only thing that's holding me back from that 4K set is I really want that movie in 3D. And I know I can buy it independently, but there's just something about having like the whole set together. Like Paramount just put out the Paranormal uh, Activity set, and it is yeah. all on Blu-ray, but they did put the thing that's the third movie in 3D, and the same thing with Shouts Remaster Friday the 13th. They have part three in 3D. I'm like, why can't they just do that for every set that has a 3D version? Just slip the disc in. Like, what's the big deal? I mean, I know it's a very niche market now, and not a lot of people have 3D TVs. I'm like, just, yeah. just do it for me, damn it. Just do it for me. Well, I have I have good news. That that disc is included in the set. Oh, it is? It is. Oh, uh, what? Act. I looked it up and it didn't have it mentioned in there. I it surprised me as I was <sighs> I was going through it because I, I also have the old box set <laughs> with the, the 3D disc, and I, I was going through it and I'm like, okay, this in in the liner notes inside the case. It just kind of casually mentions, like, also includes 3D version of the movie. Son of a bitch! It doesn't say it anywhere else. It almost caught me by surprise, because I was only looking. I was reviewing the 4K discs, so I, yeah. even, I hadn't pulled out the Blu-rays. I, I already had those in other sets. And I'm uh, literally going to go order this right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I am... 99% I will confirm right after this and I will let you know <laughs> good okay <laughs> that it's actually on the disc but it definitely said it within the special features in the liner notes just in the package mm. yes the 3d versions included which was cool so uh you might be okay there they did include it for you yes good to know <laughs> good to know <clears throat> so do you have a bunch of 3d movies is that <clears throat> something you still go back and, and watch? yeah I do I um I think currently I have about 40 titles in 3D. Uh, my job, actually, when I first moved to L.A., was converting movies to 3D. So I worked on a ton of Marvel movies. I worked on like Shrek and Top Gun, the remasters, uh, the trans some Transformer movies, a, a quite a few titles. So I've been pretty enthusiastic about 3D you know, for quite a bit now. Obviously, some movie titles really killed the whole like trend of 3D and the conversion of 3D because some studios were like, can you do this in eight weeks? And we're like, no, but we can do it in eight months. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, you know, that's that's what I think led to sort of the decline of the whole thing. But um, I just recently rewatched Avatar in 3D. And obviously, I went to go see the remaster as well, which was amazing. It looked so good. I really hope that they press a new 4K HDR 3D version if possible, if it'll fit on the disc, that'd be so cool. Um, but yeah, so I have a, I have a, it's not a massive collection. Like I'm not, I'm not the type of collector who necessarily tries to buy everything. I mostly focus and I'm sure there's a lot of people that are like this, try to just focus on the stuff that I'm really excited about. Yeah. So I don't have the most in-depth 3d collection, but it's the 3d collection that like I would want to own. Um, I think I have a few like blind spots that, that I want to try to fill. Um, but it's tough because, you know, some of these movies are only available internationally. So if I want to get anything from, I think it's after, I think it's after black Panther one. If I want to get anything from the MCU, I have to ship it in from like the UK or now it's a lot of it's available in Japan. So it's, it's a little frustrating with how like limited the inventory has become, um, here in the States. But, you know, as collectors, I think we, we were always making some kind of a sacrifice to get exactly what we're looking for. Yeah, I have I have noticed that I can't remember the last time a a movie came out in the states that had the 3D attached to it. Um, I think Elite Battle Angel might be one of the last ones. And that was what well, that was probably was that 3 years ago? Yeah, it was 2019 I think 19, it was. Yeah, so almost 4 years ago now. It's Yeah. It's been a while, but I I do think there are a lot of people who are still very passionate about it. And it, yeah. it is funny that it exists like in the UK, they tend to have those pretty readily available. Mm -hmm. And Japan does have them too, like you mentioned. So I don't know what happened here in this market. Like, cause I do feel like if 4k, which was very niche when it started, mm -hmm. if that's 
become so popular like why not i mean i guess you're limited on how many movies actually have a 3d release but right but still i mean it it, it was the thing and mm-hmm. then it just and then it just disappeared but then it's like coming yeah. back that they're still doing theatrical re-releases right so not on disc yeah and that's and that's the frustrating thing you know like jaws just recently had a 3d re-release or a 3d it was a first time release and Universal's not putting that on disc anywhere. Like it just doesn't exist anywhere. And that to me was so kind of infuriating because I thought the 3D conversion looked really great. I thought it was on par with, you know, Jurassic Park 1, Titanic, and and now we're 10 years in the future. So the conversion is even better now. It's even cleaner, all kinds of stuff because they have new tools at their disposal to make it look really good. So I'm really disappointed that they didn't end up putting that on disc anywhere in the world because I would have imported it um, from from anywhere, honestly, because I thought it was so good. I think the other big thing is, unfortunately, no one's making 3D TVs anymore. The only way you can get a 3D TV is through Craigslist or eBay or someplace where someone is selling off their 3D TV that's now, you know, six to eight years old. Um, So I think that's the tough part. My hope is... and. You know, there's no guarantees, but my hope is that with Avatar coming out, that maybe it will spark some interest in some TV manufacturers to even if they put out one limited edition 3D 4K HDR television, you know, if it's 2000 bucks, like I'll buy it, you know, whatever. <laughs> I do love the TV that I have. Problem is, is, you know, as as we all know, technology advances. So the HDR technology gets better, the color, right. the everything about the TV gets better. So there are some things that are like a little bit out of date on my television that won't play through my Xbox One S. So I think that's, there's always a little bit of like a compromise there is I I get the, t- I have the TV that I, that I want. It has 4K 3D but I'm compromising a little bit of quality in terms of like where we are now technologically in 2023. So it it kind of sucks. And I know that my movies will probably look even better on a newer display, but it's the 3d that I, that I want to try to hold on to for as long as I can. So hopefully maybe in a year or in the next six months to a year, there will be at least one 3d 4k TV that will hopefully come out, but we'll see. Yeah. I think that's the way to do it too. Is sort of, it has to be a, it, it would be like a limited edition type release, some special edition. But if they tied it into Avatar, like that would, that would work. Cause I think that yeah. is, I mean, you, I, th- I feel like you have a better finger on your pulse when it comes to like the Hollywood stuff. So, I mean, is that movie trending as big as people think it is? Because I'm, I don't know if I'm totally convinced that people want it. 13 mm-hmm. years after the last one or, you know, 14 years after the last one, by the time it right. comes out. Right. So like, what, what is your sense on those? Like, is it going to be the same phenomenon that like the first one was? That's a really good question. I mean, from conversations that I've had and even just the things that I see on social media, it doesn't seem to be trending or as hyped up now. But I also don't know what it was like for the first movie. Like, were people really that hyped for the first Avatar? Or was it until, was it when it released and people started seeing it that then word of mouth spread that this movie was, you know, so impressive, technologically savvy and all these sorts of things. So I don't know. I I mean, I definitely think that, you know, 13 years removed, it is a long time. Um, the one thing though, that I, that I did notice when the remaster came out was that there started to be a lot more conversations about avatar again. And a lot of people, whether they were, you know, within our age group or even younger, they came out of that movie and maybe prior to it, were maybe a little bit cynical about the movie. And maybe it's because they had only seen it once when they were a kid or their exposure to it on social media kind of gave them a limited sort of view as to what that movie was. But most people who went back and, and saw the remaster came out going, this movie is actually one better than I remember, and two looks incredibly good for her. It being thirteen years old now, so I, I think that the combination of that and and maybe just general interest in what the movie could be could be enough to lure people back in and to maybe reignite the the love for three D because um, I, I would love to see it. <laughs> it would be amazing because yeah. again, it's like if three D is done right, whether it's conversion or shot, I think it'd be done right in both both formats. Um, I, I think that it can be a really fun experience. Yeah, I think I think though, re- <clears throat> going back to two thousand nine, that how I remember the hype is that 
it was not super hyped beforehand. And it was that word of mouth. People came out of there, came out of the 3D um, and just were like, okay, I, I need to go back and watch that again because that was like the best 3D experience I've ever had. Right. That was the best. Like this movie is unbelievable. It's incredible. Like that's what I remember is that it had a bunch of like post launch hype and mm. then lived on for like months, almost yeah. like in, in the 13 years I, I th- before Top Gun, I would have thought it's like a bigger deal. Like, and then that was 30 and it just mm-hmm. blew up the box. So I feel like you never know. Y- yeah. I would have said that's probably a little too long. Are you going to be able to, you know, the people who were excited about that movie 30 years ago are now mm-hmm. what 60 years old. Are they getting out to the theaters? And I mean, it just excited everybody again. Yeah. So <laughs> that movie is so great. <laughs> yeah. It is. I, I had when I was reviewing it, I was just like, I don't, this is so lame. Like, I don't know what to say other than just awesome. Like, it's yeah. just awesome to look at and yeah. awesome to watch and just yeah. so much fun. And it's, I mean, the, the effects and what they were able to do 30 years ago. That movie's fun. It's, mm-hmm. it's definitely a great movie. This was, I mean, it's night and day with what they can do with planes now and, and, yeah. and camera equipment and, you know, yeah. just unbelievable. And yeah. one of the one of the best discs too. If you haven't, I don't know if you've seen. The don't have it yet. Discs. Don't have it yet. Oh. I know. Ooh. I know. That's a, that's oh a god! Whole theater experience. Here's a question for you: Are the IMAX sequences expanded, or is it all in scope? No, they're expanded. Yeah, so I'm gonna it, need uh, that disc immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> it's really nice. That's it's so really cool. nice. Yeah. So nice. that I, I do love when they do that because. Uh, Disney doesn't do it. It drives me nuts because it looks so good on Disney Plus, And I'm like, why can't I get that on my disc? They stopped and that was, doing it. That was the other thing that I loved about the 3D, um, the 3D Marvel films. All of the 3D Marvel films up until Black Panther, they had the expanded aspect ratios. Yeah. So anytime it did that, it was great. I, I loved watching in that format because it would all of a sudden open up like Black Panther when they go into Wakanda for the first time through the mountain you can see the thing expand and it's just, it's just such a fun experience. And yeah, it's very frustrating. And you know, now the only way to watch infinity war and Endgame in IMAX format is on Disney plus. I have mixed feelings about that because, you know, I think, I, I think the very common conversation with amongst people like us, is we talk about the, the, the bit rate limitations of streaming yeah. and the whole purpose of having the disc is that you can experience sort of like the full, it's never going to be, well, I shouldn't say never, now it's not going to be, you know, to the point where it's completely lossless, but it is a much more uh, truer representation of what the movie actually looks like in its final form. So I would like to be able to see those movies, you know, on a disc in IMAX in 3D at some point eventually, too. So but yeah, I mean, I, I really wish that they would do more of those expanded IMAX formats. I think nope. I, I don't know if that version has the expanded IMAX yeah. stuff. Uh, it does. Yep. Yep, same there. Another so, one I need to get. Yeah. Do the special features? This we're like go, going off tangent so much, but do the That's special right. features have like the original IMAX <laughs> photography? Like in in the special features, they talk yeah. About so that? like Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight <laughs> trilogy in the collector's edition, they have like the full IMAX ratio, like the original stuff on one of the bonus discs. And I didn't know if Nope was going to uh, do that for the whole movie. No, no. But what it, it but it does it it switches aspect ratio throughout so nice i mean the first it's pretty backloaded to the second half of the movie yeah where that kicks in uh, that's cool i'm glad almost, they did that though yeah almost the entire like third act is is expanded so yeah i mean it looks looks fantastic there there is some really cool special features on it too though there's like a long uh, basically a documentary that jordan peele put together it's like an hour oh, wow. long that talks about the making of and th- there's some good stuff on there but no, yeah. there is there isn't like just that IMAX version that would that would cut in and um, mm-hmm. didn't include that, but at least it does expand when it's when it's meant to. Which right, right, right was yeah was definitely lacking in a bunch of movies. Used used to be a thing was very big with like the Nolan movies, mm-hmm. and then they like stopped doing it, and now they're like bringing it back. So yeah, Dune didn't do it. I'm like, <clears throat> what is wrong with yeah. you people? What the right. hell? <laughs> right, like that's the perfect movie. Yeah, so. It does seem like it's coming back. Um, mm-hmm. So nope, nope was universal. 
Top Gun's what? Who, who has Paramount? Top Gun Paramount. So, yeah, we'll see if Warner Brothers can come around and start doing mm. it again. But yeah, uh, at least those two seem like you know, and and maybe it's the status of the movie too. You know, that's that's what I found is that the bigger the bigger the movie, you're more likely to get all the bells and whistles. Right, versus, right. You know, some of the indie stuff, even if it is, it does look great. Maybe they skip an audio track off of it or they don't right. do Atmos or something like that. So, mm-hmm. yeah, we'll see. I mean, Nope and Top Gun obviously being you know, two of the big ones this year. So they right. uh, they went all out on those two discs and it's great. Mm-hmm. It's awesome to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, what are going back to the 3d because i'm not super familiar like what are Mm. some of the highlights for that format because i really haven't i can't remember last time i did i have a 3d tv Mm -hmm. it's just hd it's now up in my bedroom Mm -hmm. um i don't even know if i still have the player but it's been a while since i've seen a disc so i'm curious like what are what are some of the big hits for that format yeah, so I mean, if you if you have a PlayStation Four, that'll play 3D Blu-rays. Oh, there we go. Um, so there you go. You should be all set up there. Um, I would say that for for me personally, I think Avatar for sure, the first Jurassic World, uh, Gemini Man, I think looks really good. <clears throat> Just the 60 FPS is a little bit of an of an adjustment. Yeah. Um, let's see what other ones. Uh, I, I think Alita Battle Angel looks really good as well. Um, even some of the converted ones, um, like some of the Marvel ones, I think are, are really good. Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness is an excellent 3D conversion. I thought that looked really, really good. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. What else do I have? Refer to my little my collection up there. I mean, I even think um, some of the DC stuff like Shazam and Aquaman look, look really good. I have Wizard of Oz in 3D, which I think looks pretty good. So not... All of them are bangers. Like some of them don't don't have as much depth as yeah. others. Um, I think with somebody like James Cameron, especially with like Titanic, he tried to go for a very linear look. So he wanted the 3D conversion to look almost exactly like it would look if you were to shoot it. Whereas with Marvel, when we worked on those movies, they had this thing called Party in the Front where everything in the foreground would be a lot more 3D than in the background. So backgrounds, if there's buildings, they'd probably be like one flat card instead of them being broken out. Whereas everything in the foreground, if it's characters and you know weapons or whatever's in the foreground explosions, it's very much detailed. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas with something like Titanic, it doesn't matter if it's in the background or the foreground, it's all getting the same love. So I think that is something that, that I really like about that movie. Um, but then, you know, there's... There's some movies that, like Dune, for example, it's a little flatter, but it's still cool to kind of see and get an understanding of scope and scale and relationships between certain things. So I think those are some of the ones that I really love. And honestly, even the cheesy ones, Friday the 13th Part (laughs) 3, shot on film. And those cameras, as we know, are enormous. So to get the 3D cameras, to get the two cameras close enough where the 3D is actually watchable, it doesn't always work successfully. So you'll have a character who has like a shovel and the back end of the shovel is like in your brain. It feels like it's in your head, Um, but it's still just such a fun experience to see Jason Voorhees running around chasing people and cutting them up in 3d. So yeah, there's some of those, you know, that, that I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know, you really kind of take advantage of the format in a silly way. Yeah. You're a horror movie. I don't expect it to be the most like, I don't know. It's, I feel like horror or I feel like 3d, depending on the genre of film, I feel like the application is a little bit different. If it's horror, I want it to kind of be exaggerated and silly and, you know, kind of lean into that. If it's something that's like Dune, yeah, I want it to be a little bit more built out, make it feel a little bit more realistic. But yeah, so uh, Spider-Man No Way Home looked really good in 3D too. I actually got that one from Australia. And the only way I was able to watch it was if I pulled the movie from the disc and put it on my Plex server. So I was able yeah. to make that work. <laughs> I know it's so it's really crazy the hoops that sometimes you have to jump through just to get you'd think as movie lovers and consumers they'd make it easier but I swear so let's make a region 2 3d blu-ray okay Sony what the hell right right. like in how I I, you can't convince me that the Australian 3d market is going to sell more than the North American 3 like just numbers just population like how did that 
I have a friend who lives in Australia and they like were barely able to get 3D screenings of the Avatar remaster or Avatar 2. Now, finally, it's come out that like, yes, we're going to be doing them. But for a while, my friend was messaging me like, I don't know if this is going to happen. I'm like, well, then what's the point? Why even? That's the whole thing of the movie is the 3D of it. So it's, it's so weird how the choices are made. Yeah, I don't I don't fully understand the business thinking that goes into yeah. some of this because it just yeah, how does how does the UK have a larger market than than the United States? I, right. I know for a fact it doesn't. So how, like what's the justification? Right. And it's a, you know, when I talk to the studio it's always well, it's time and it's money and it's you know, you have to have a return like any business. Right. So why did you have the time and money to do that as a region? be release right and and sell it to one of your smaller markets but not the bigger market i also just think it's so crazy that all these studios have not adopted some sort of like made on demand system where you can go to like their their studio store online and just click through and say i want the 4k i want the 3d okay it's a eight dollar upcharge for the 3d okay and then they can just press it for you and send it like even if it ends up costing me $35 or $40 total. If I get the versions that I want, I don't care. Like I'll pay for it. So it's so strange to me that, you know, um, Paramount has completely stopped doing 3d three. Well, as far as I thought they were, they completely stopped doing 3d Blu-ray, but then they put out this paranormal activity box set and it had a 3d Blu-ray. So I'm sure it's probably a 3d Blu-ray from, you know, years ago when it comes to new movies, they're not pressing anything in 3d. You know, so it's so strange to me that there isn't some sort of a way for me to just go to a website that the studios own where I can just literally click through, have it made and sent to my house. I, I, I don't know. I don't know why that's not a thing. I don't know if it's some sort of a distribution thing or whatever the case may be, um, you know, like Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol or not Ghost Protocol. It's um, Mission Impossible Fallout. There is a 3D version that exists. It yeah. only played, I think, in the UK. Um, so it's like, why can't I not get that? Right. Or, it's, or it you know, any of the Fast and the Furious movies that have come out in 3D. It's yeah. just so strange. You know, I've, we've, we've talked with a few people on this, the podcast about manufacturing, and I don't get why they don't just manufacture on demand either, because yeah. then it's a, you, you can't really lose. Somebody has to give you the money up front. Right. And, you know, you're not going to make anything until you get the $40 from somebody. And so then what? It costs you five bucks to put it together and throw yeah how much does it really cost you to put a put a digital file on a disc right and And print out some artwork like packaging costs nothing yeah the artwork costs no i mean you could have it could be automated like you don't even need a person to sit there and do that here's the case disc comes out of the machine Mm -hmm. robot takes the disc puts it in puts it in the box ships it out like done so yeah i don't i don't fully understand because they aren't and it's not like they're available anywhere else. It's not right. like their argument is, oh, well, well, it's on, you know, it's on Paramount Plus, so we're not going to put it on disc. It's available there. No, right. there's like no 3D streaming stuff. No, the only anywhere. thing that's a, the only place you can get um, some 3D movies is Vudu. You can rent them. Yeah, that's it. But I, I think there's maybe 20 titles on there, 15, 20 titles, and it's some of them are really cool movies, and some of them you're like, mm, have the Megan 3D. I don't know if I need to see that. Whatever. Um, yeah. otherwise, yeah, it's no streaming service except for, I think shutter maybe has one 3d movie, the rest of them. Nope. Not yeah. existent. And, and it's just, it's not, it's 3d. It's like, well, there's a, there's an HD version of true lies that's out there. Like why it's there. It, mm-hmm. it, why can't I get that on a disc? I have or a theory Pan about those James Cameron movies and why they're not out in 4k yet, but is it a theory you want to share? Uh, I can. Sure. Gossip. Yeah. Well, I'm all for gossip. <laughs> well, so, you know, with the Avatar remaster, he went through the process of converting the film to 48 frames per second and applying motion motion grading to it. Yep. I have a strong feeling that that's probably what he's going to be doing with the abyss and true lies and possibly a new remaster of T2 in the future. Uh, oh. You know, all of his movies, except for I think Terminator are at Fox. So it would not surprise me that he would go through that process and apply that to all of his films. He seems to be pretty hyped up about 48 FPS. I know Avatar 2, it's all 48 FPS um, with the motion grading applied to it. So I think that could be the reason why he hasn't um, put out those movies because he's doing Avatar right now. 
Avatar is going to get a re-release and it's going to be 48 frames per second, 4K HDR, all that stuff. So it wouldn't surprise me if maybe next year or the year after that, they'll announce like, oh, we're also doing The Abyss, maybe Aliens and True Lies. So I'm like, thank God about time. So I think that's what the holdup is. So you you did see, you said you saw Avatar, the new 48 I did. Per sec- you saw it in theater. How was that? Because I am, I am skeptical of how that's going to look at home. For sure. Yeah, no, um, I was the same. And then I actually went to True Motion in Burbank and they showed me a demo of how they do it. And okay. the thing that was super impressive to me was that it doesn't look 48 frames per second. It's in 48 frames, the whole thing. But, but the stuff that is, is, meant to look 48 frames per second meaning there's less motion blur so the images look a little bit clearer you can tell that's 48 frames per second but the stuff that's meant to look 24 fps looks 24 fps and it has a lot to do with the the tools that they use to dial back in things like motion blur and to really kind of manipulate the image to make it look like it's 24 frames per second so my theory in the beginning was that they were switching the projector to go from 24 to 48 that's not the case. The whole movie exists at 48 frames per second, and then they're able to motion grade it so it looks like 24 FPS. It's it's pretty impressive tech um, because, yeah, again, I was also very skeptical about it, and I was like, this is not going to look good. And then I saw the movie, and I was like, oh, my God, this looks great. Like, there's a f- couple of scenes where you can tell that it's a higher frame rate, but for the most part, it looks really really good like mo- most people that i saw with were like oh i would have never known that it's 48 fps if you didn't tell me huh that's that is i i made a video when it when the news broke and i was like oh please like don't just have this be avatar soap op- so- soap opera effect like i right. don't and that's what i was afraid of and then some people the, in the comments a few people had said no 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 you need to check out this true motion tech because it's really it's much smarter than you turning on motion smoothing on your tv like oh yeah much smoother by frame like they go through and really remaster this thing yeah it took them uh took them three weeks to do the whole movie which is actually like i i thought that was not that long but and and they're able to calibrate it on a shot by shot basis so it's not you're not just applying one version of it for an entire sequence. You're going shot by shot. You're looking at the motion. You're seeing what's happening, and then you're dialing it in custom uh, in a custom manner. So that's really cool. And, and I don't, you know, there were some things that they could talk about, some things they couldn't talk about. But it seems like potentially, and this is like not a confirmed thing, that their goal is to hopefully implement their technology into new television sets. So in a lot of ways, how we use metadata with 4K HDR, the plan would be to also use true motion metadata to then apply that to your movie. So then that way it'll also auto calibrate or, you know, use the data, use the metadata to run true motion as you're watching the film as well at home. So a lot of potential, a lot of potential. I, I have no idea, you know, where that is in the pipeline, but I was excited to kind of hear that stuff from them. Yeah, I'd be really curious to see how that looks on something that's older that is a lot older than avatar that isn't so digital like right i i'd be super like give me a movie from the 70s give me right. jaws and try right. to do that i'm still skeptical i guess but yeah but and- i mean i was skeptical of a lot of things and hdr and you know it they kind of it took a little bit but they right they got it down yeah for sure, for sure. Yeah, and you know, their thing was like they can do any frame rate. They've done stuff, you know, all the way down to 12, all the way up to like 60 and beyond. So even something like Gemini Man that I personally don't think works at 60 FPS. I think it's there's too much it's like too clean. I think if they were to if they were able to run it through their true motion process and bring it down to 48 um, and then run it through motion grading, or even if they did just leave it at 60, but run it through motion grading, I think the movie would probably look a lot would it be a lot easier to look at sometimes. I mean, I saw the movie at 120 frames in 4K and it was only playing in one theater in LA. Um, so I went to go see it and man, it was, I, I got it, my eyes adjusted to it after a bit, but it was a tough watch in the beginning. It was just, you felt like you were being overloaded with data. This was Gem- Gemini, man. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I mean, that is a, the movie looks very very clean it's it is, super clean 
it is a major adjustment from what yeah. you're used to. Even the cleanest of the clean, like digital movies that have yeah. come out recently. Yeah, like 1917 is a pretty clean movie. Yeah, and and Gemini Man is like, <clears throat> Lord, it's like over sharpening in Photoshop or something. Yeah, yeah, which is that, and it's it looks great on your. T- if you can get used to it, it looks great, but it yeah. is a kind of a shock and adjustment, and it's not perfectly done. Mm -hmm. so those that's what makes me skeptical Mm -hmm. is stuff like that but you know i i good to know about true motion because i hadn't i hadn't talked to him maybe that's a good person i should get on a podcast episode talk about what they're gonna do because yeah and i think like the next that could be a new format that's like me for sure years maybe i'm reviewing not only now dolby vision and hdr grading but motion grading for sure new you know and they seem very open to it. I think, uh, you know, for w- with whatever they're able to talk about, they seem pretty open to to wanting to kind of like get it out there that they're working on it. Um, I have a couple of videos that I'm going to be working on that will come out closer to Avatar to talk about it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it seems like a very promising thing. And I always feel like James Cameron is the type of guy who kind of keeps his finger on the pulse of where display technology is going. So he must see something in it that he thinks is worth exploring so i also want to like kind of pay attention to it and see yeah what tv sets does it show up on if if i can get a tv in a couple years that has 4k hdr plus 3d plus true motion i'm like and filmmaker mode i'm like damn that's that's kind of like a, a home consumer film enthusiasts dream in a lot of ways i think yeah and he's doing the same he's doing titanic too right same. he is technology so mm-hmm. you know you're probably on to something that that's what he's looking at for the rest of his catalog too yeah um if he really loves it because he has sort of done he did the 3d thing for a lot mm-hmm. of the catalog so that would make sense i would yeah. love to see him do t2 again because that that 4k isn't isn't brutal. right a little so, brutal a little brutal <laughs> yeah it's not right so i'm not i'm not i'm not into i'm not into the 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 this design choice that directors go back and like scrub their movies of most, most of their grain. Um, I feel like it's like, you got to lean into the aesthetic. And if the, right. if your aesthetic was, if your thing was shooting it on super 35, then you have to embrace everything that comes with it and not, you know, remove this character. Like film grain is a character, you know, in a, yeah. in a movie in, in classic film. So I think you need to just like, accept that that's what it is. Like with Top Gun, when we did the remaster, uh, years ago when we did the HD re- or it was a 2K remaster that we then converted to 3D they were extremely particular about us putting the grain back exactly the way it was like and when I say perfection it was like they would go into the blue channel of the source to see how the grain would move and if it didn't match close enough they would have us redo it so I, I but I appreciate that I appreciate that level of detail of wanting to maintain the original movie for what it was just in a different format yeah no I'm a, I'm a big believer in that too like if you if you start scrubbing a movie clean it, on it looks worse almost every time oh yeah so the, it the never intention, looks good yeah the intention is yeah let's make it look better and cleaner and more modern no it doesn't work and it just ends up looking horrible and i yeah yep. you need the grain it is it's part of the movie it, yeah it kind of it kind of sews the seams together in a way it, yeah, it does, and it, it's honest, it's more detailed in a lot of ways mm-hmm. than what you can get when you smooth it over. You're losing edges and you're losing the fine detail that that yep. gives you. So yeah, I can't can't stand that. But um, I did want to ask you because I didn't I didn't know this coming in. But so you, how how does you worked on these 3D conversions? Like, mm-hmm. what is the process to take a movie, especially an older movie, a, a Top Gun? Mm. Or, a, or a Jaws that's pushing 50 years old. How do you take that and turn that into 3D 50 years later? Yeah, so as far as I know, uh, because I wasn't at the studio when they did Jaws, but Universal had done that 4K remaster. I think maybe it's been like eight years now. So I'm sure that they use used a lot of that stuff. But when it came yeah. to Top Gun, because that there, ha- there hadn't been a recent like 2K or high quality scan of that movie... They actually had the the studio I was working at. They actually had to go through private vendors who owned reels of the movies. Mm -hmm. And they found, I think it was six reels long or five reels long. They found the best five reels they could find around the world in English that they could then do the highest quality scan of. 
So that was the starting point was like finding the reels that had the best possible version that they could scan back into the computer and then give us different studios do the 3d conversions a little bit differently. The studio that I worked at were where movies like um, jaws and Mad Max and the Marvel movies were done. They used nuke and the way that they would do it is they would have a roto team go in and literally rotoscope every single thing on the screen every single part of a person, every background element, every foreground element, a door handle, a sink, like literally everything. Sometimes it would also be kind of dictated based on sort of the predetermined depth of the movie. So if they know that the movie is primarily going to focus on the 3D in the foreground, they won't go as detailed in the background. Whereas with a movie like Titanic, because it's linear, they rotoscope every single piece on the frame. Uh, And then we go through a process where we create, it kind of looks like a Z depth pass on a 3d model. So it's basically just like a black and white representation of the object and it like great. And it's like a gradient from white to black. So then anything that's white is closest to camera. Everything that is back falls to the background. So then we would go in with these custom ramps and let's say we're creating a face so we, our studio was kind of known for doing 3D faces really well. So what we would do is we would basically make the face, you know, one solid color and then use ramps to in 3D push, you know, the top and the sides back. So we would basically go in and use gradient ramps to sculpt everything in 3D. Then you have to track all those ramps and track all those objects in 3D space. If a character moves forward in space, you know, the rate at which he comes at camera in 3D has to sort of logically and mathematically makes sense to how much distance he travels in 2d in the 2d image so there's a lot of like fine tuning and calculating and figuring out how to make all that stuff work but it's a very meticulous process the longest project i was on i think was maybe mad max and i think we did that over the course of eight months six to eight months um most of the marvel stuff we tried to do under six Marvel was hard sometimes because they would change sequences or they would update VFX shots weeks before the movie was meant to be done. So sometimes, you know, you'd have to go through and the roto team would have to adjust all their rotoscopes, rotoscoping. We'd have to go through and adjust our ramps and stuff. So it's a, it's a very meticulous, tedious and long process, but it was very fulfilling to then go sit in a theater and watch how the movie turned out. There's a short BTS from titanic and i think it's on youtube that you can actually see our old studio and they talk about the 3d conversion process and they show a little bit of how it looks um because it's a little hard to explain it's always easier when you have a little bit of like a visual representation sure. um but yeah so it was it was, a, it was a really long process very meticulous process but it, it was it was fun if you were with the right people because we'd always you know make it fun um long days you know 12 14 hour days sometimes six seven days a week it was it was crunch for two years sometimes yeah no that's that's great i mean so part of that is is that it is very cost intensive to yes. to do this which is why you don't see as many right which makes sense even more so than just taking a taking the movie cool oh, you have to do this too i guess to get there you need to find original sources if you don't have them scan it up at a high resolution that mm-hmm. takes time and money then do the 3d so yeah it's it sounds like quite the process i'll have to look at that behind the scenes because i don't know much about it but that's a super cool uh, yeah super cool job that you get to you know do that and then like you said you know go and watch the finished product with an audience like not many people get to do that with their work. So yeah. And you know, it's, um, it's changed a lot in the last, you know, eight, six, six, six to eight years. And the technology has changed. Like I saw Dr. Strange in the multiverse of madness and that's converted by the same studio I used to work at. The quality is just like insane. Cause like flyaway hairs, you don't think about that. Those are really hard to do in 3d because you have to be, it, it is a, you're using like one pixel of painting to basically paint the hairs back in. So they actually are at the proper depth. Um, but they did some amazing work, but yeah, it's come, a, it's come a long way and I think it'll just continue to get better as long as there are movies to be worked on. Hmm. And I wonder too, if it, if it gets better, if the technology gets faster, if it becomes easier to do, you'd probably start to see it come back. Yeah, um, I think so. And that it's probably, that's probably a big reason is it is still, it must still be very intense mm-hmm. a process and yeah 
you know, I'd love to see him one day be able to do it without the glasses because that's what that's what kills me. I don't know how it is for you. Like my eyes are, I don't wear contacts or glasses or anything, but I definitely have one eye that's worse than another, mm-hmm. and I have to sort of self correct it, which mm. I've kind of just taught myself how to do. So I don't really wear a contact. I would need one just for one eye, but when I put those glasses on, I get such headaches because it's. I'm almost migraine, you know, like stress oh, headache wow. because I'm trying so hard to fix that little lazy eye thing that I have. And mm-hmm. then the 3D is messing with it. So I've always had kind of a hard time. And mm. I would love to get to a point where you don't need that, <laughs> where I can just like yeah. on a display, be able to get that experience. Yeah. I know that they were experimenting with something like that years ago. But I just don't think it was to the standard of quality that James Cameron wants so i don't know i don't know how long it'll be but you know i thankfully you know for me because i do wear glasses the real d3d glasses are kind of the best option because they're so flat Mm. um it gets a little tricky well i hate i do not like the battery powered 3d glasses i've never liked those um the quality is nice but i just in general don't like the idea of using battery powered glasses because they're too heavy um but dolby 3d and real d3d are my preferred dolby 3d obviously has the advantages that it has the Dolby quality to it, the Dolby brightness and color and all that stuff. But real D 3d still looks great. You know, it still looks really, really good. Yeah. And that's, that's the worst part for me is that I do think like I have a good time with them and I think they looked great. Mm -hmm. And I literally had to, I had to stop going to see them in the theaters because I was like, I can't, I can't get through. Like I'll just go to the Dolby cinema version instead because I, I still get some of those benefits. Right. And yeah, I think I think that would be a game changer, and that's where you would see if the technology gets better to be able to do these new transfers to 3D faster, cheaper. Mm-hmm. If the TV or display tech comes along where you don't need the glass, I think then it's then it's game changer. Then it's for know, sure. Let's go 48 frames, 3D, 4K H. Like throw the throw everything at the wall. And yeah, <laughs> let's just have a crazy good time with it. And yeah, that would be, that'd be cool. So for sure. Hopefully that's where, you know, tech goes. I mean, resolution wise, there's not much more they can do. So they've got to sort of get creative out of the box with how can we make displays better? And Mm -hmm. that's probably a natural way to do it. That and and this motion tech. Yeah. And, you know, truthfully, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at 4k. Like I don't need any higher resolutions. I don't need 6k. I, 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 for most 35 millimeter scans going over 4k, 6k, you're not even like at that point, it's, I just don't think the quality is there anymore. It's different when you're talking about IMAX photography, of course, but I think with 35 millimeter film, I think it kind of caps around 6k. So I'm like, you know what? I think 4k is good. I think keep it as it is. If there's a future where discs are able to hold higher bit rates, then like, sure, maybe you can do re you can repress some of these movies to be in higher bit rates, but I'm very satisfied with a lot of the remasters I have now. I, I, I don't think I'll get to a place where I'm like, Oh, I need to get the new one. Like, I'm pretty, I'm pretty happy. I think now it's like you're saying, focusing on making the display technology look as best as it possibly can look. Um, so, you know, film enthusiasts like us at home can really feel like we're, we're getting a really good experience. I mean, for me, nothing will exceed the theatrical experience for me. Like that's always going to be sort of my primary thing that I love, but that's not to say that the, that the at home experience can't be perfect for you just at home watching, you know, your own movie collection. Yeah. I mean, and these things are, you know, there are these reference displays that people use to, to edit and they cost, you know, ridiculous amounts of money. So, you know, that's, that's where I'd rather see stuff go. Give me, give me improved color. Mm. Um, Give me that new, whatever motion, give me new technology. But yeah, I'm I'm with you. Like, honestly, even a 1080p Blu-ray, if it's been scanned at 4k resolution, a lot of times I look at them and I go, the HDR, big difference. A lot of times that's mm-hmm. a selling point. But like, if you're pre- you're really looking at it and trying to go like, how many pores can I count on that guy's face on Blu-ray versus 4K? It's like, really, if you do that comparison, it's kind of one to one. There's there's right. not a huge huge difference there. The vast majority of people would never see it. So. Mm-hmm that's already so small to go from right. 4k to like, people always ask me, where's the 8k discs? And I'm like, no point. No, there's no, no point. point. And, and, and their argument is always, well, 35 millimeter can go up to eight or 16 K. I'm like, 
if it's an absolutely pristine source, that's perfect. But you know that for a hundred years, we don't have those sources for movies. no. So like, like how many movies, how many camera negatives do we actually have of some of these films? Probably yeah. not a ton. And even so, if you do, it's like Friday the Thirteenth is never going to look any better than it's no, right now. That no. movie just doesn't look that great. It's yeah. Not, it, you can't. They didn't yeah. have budget. They didn't have lighting. They don't have the right. You know the cameras. It was. I mean, Halloween, a movie that I that I adore and love with every ounce of my being, mm-hmm. like higher than four K. Like it, that, it, most of the movies in the dark. I mean, right, it doesn't right. need anything else. Like it's it yeah. is right now. I think at the best place that it possibly could be, and yeah. that's more than enough for me. You know. No, I'm I'm with you, and that's what I keep telling people. Even even the TV. I mean, they're starting to not even sell the TVs. They tried to push them, and then like so dumb. What do I need an AK TV for? <clears throat> you don't. And I've had one. Well, I got one in for review because I was curious, and I can tell you, there's. I, if you had told me it was 4K, I would have said, "Yep, it's a right. pretty decent 4K TV." But it, it didn't make a difference. The The difference that you see, and this is why they're not doing the AK, you're going to see new OLED advancements and new color advancements and mini LED and these sorts of things. But the resolution doesn't matter. It's it's the tech on top of it that people should be right. worried about. So, Agreed. <clears throat> well, we're coming to the end here. Before we go, I did you know want to talk to you about what you've been doing on YouTube and obviously give you a give you a chance to talk about like your channel and what's been going on there because i know we're both uh we're both getting so close to 100k (laughs) god so so close it hurts we're so we're both so close so i'm going to give you the hopefully a little promotion here and you guys if you haven't if you haven't gone i'll put all the links in the description for this video but go support because let me tell you it's it's a lot of fun to grow and then you get to 97 or 98 and you're like oh son of a bitch <laughs> let me let me just get there let me just hit that mark because then it yeah. doesn't matter till you hit a million so it's like i just want to hit that milestone you know so yeah for yeah, sure what, are, what have you guys been up to yeah um so we've we've um it's interesting this is this channel is sort of like the th- third iteration of of kind of like our youtube career Mm -hmm. and this is the first one where we've been doing a lot of reaction content so we've been going through every marvel series most of the star wars series some of the dc series we've been making reaction content out of so we'll get together and we'll watch these shows together um and it's 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 really it really has changed sort of the way that i consume a lot of this stuff but in a good way like watching it with my friends on camera has been such a fun experience. We're in the middle of doing the boys. We're on, we just started yeah. season three and we had never seen it before. Oh, and that season three premiere is crazy. <laughs> yeah. So it's been a, it's been really, really fun to, to, to do all that. We have gone through and we also have been doing some movies. So before rings of power, we did the Lord of the Rings trilogy, even though they're not connected. Um, we did Carpenter's Halloween and we did the new Blumhouse trilogy. So it's just been a really fun way for me to get together with my friends and we're able to do it remotely um, for, for a lot of the stuff. Um, but for some upcoming stuff like avatar, we're going to watch it in 3d all in one place. So that'll be a lot of fun. Nice. It's been a really fun way. I think for, for me to revisit a lot of stuff that I haven't seen in years and to watch new things as well and discover new stuff. So that's primarily been our focus on YouTube, um, is doing that stuff. We also do have a podcast that we put out probably around two times a month. Um, it's sometimes it's a little hard to slot in days to shoot the podcast just because we're doing so much reaction content. Yeah. Um, and then we're doing reviews as well. Like we're about to put out a review for black Panther Wakanda forever. Um, so yeah, we're just having fun watching stuff together, hanging out and, uh, just looking at that, that subscription count going up slowly, but surely. And like just waiting to get to a hundred K so we can do a fun little live stream with our audience. Oh, that's, that's what I'm waiting for. I mean, the hundred K mark is, super cool because as a youtuber it's the first time they sort of acknowledge you yes by, with with the plaque you know that yeah. I, people always ask like why are you so dead set on that number and i'm like it's just i don't know in my head it's like a sort of validation for the community too because totally. there, aren't, there aren't a lot of like my channel is physical media and what a what a niche I don't know of another one that's hit 100K yet. There are people who talk about it and there are people yeah. who mix, mix it in, but they're not purely focused. So for me, it's a little bit of validation that like this niche made it and we broke sure. that mark. 
but it's also just validation that like, Hey, you, you know, you built something in this massive conglomerate that you <laughs> upload your videos to has acknowledged yeah. that you exist. <laughs> and I mean, so. I even, I've even heard from friends who are content creators who now, who have now have, you know, millions of subscribers, but you know, they've even told me that when you pass a hundred thousand, yes, you get the acknowledgement from YouTube. You also start to get more acknowledgement from studios. They start to look at your channel yeah. as a way of like, Oh, okay. You do have some, you do have some quote unquote influence. Let's right. invite you to something or let's send you a thing or you know, here's a Blu-ray, here's a movie pass to go see Black Adam, go review it or whatever. So, you know, it, it's, um, it is a bit of a grind to, to, to hit those numbers, but you know, our hope is that as that continues to climb and we continue to grow, that we'll get more opportunities like that, where we can take our audience behind the scenes to screenings or events or whatever the case may be. And hopefully it'll allow me to open up a little bit of time so I can actually on camera talk about, you know, some of these new restorations and 4k movies that I, that I love so much. Yeah, that'd be cool. I'd love to see that added. And I think I saw, did you guys get invited to that Wakanda forever premiere the other day? Or did you just like sign up? Was that, uh, that was he, cool. That was by, uh, what's his name? Straw hat goofy. Yeah. So Straw we got, goofy. we got invited to that. That was, that was nice. really cool and unexpected. You know, we, we do get invited by Disney to their, um, like press and media screenings which are fun. It's great to be able to get like, we're super thankful that we get the opportunity to even see the movies early. It is a very different crowd though, because it's primarily press. So I had somebody next to me taking notes while they were watching the movie. And I'm like, I don't even know how you can do that in the dark. Yeah. First of all. So it was great to be able to go to the screening that straw Hat goofy put on because very enthusiastic crowd. Those people were there for the movie. They were there to be excited. They were there to have fun. And, we had a great time. You know, they cheered in all the places that I had cheered at the first screening. They felt, you know, emotion and they, and they felt the suspense and the thrill in all the parts that I felt it in the first time. So it was really cool to experience that movie with, with that type of an audience as well. I think that's the, and I think that's the future of press screenings anyway, you know, as, the New York times is an establishment, you know, entertainment weekly, whatever they're all establishments, but the world is shifting to more authentic Mm -hmm. creator focused stuff. And that is where people are consuming content. So I could totally see like 10 years from now, hopefully those press screenings are like the one you went to with Stry goofy, where it's just like, these are going to be people who are just passionate. Mm -hmm. Sure. They have to have a platform or something. They, you know, you're a creator, but you're just a passionate fan Right. And for me, that's almost a better review than somebody's going to sit there and take notes because yeah, we can all critique the, the technical merits of something, but like, how did, uh, how did the average person actually feel about it? Who hasn't mm-hmm. seen 10 million movies over the last 30 years, Right. you know, comparing notes for, for Wakanda forever to, you know, well, this reminded me of a scene from the graduate and I'm like, Ugh, it's, these are different things. We're talking, Mm. we're in a different space here. You know, we need to evaluate certain movies differently than others. Um, Right. And that's where I think some of the big press outlets just struggle. Like they just can't, Mm. they can't adjust to the type of movie and the audience it's made for. Everything is just so black and white. Mm. So I'm excited for that. And hopefully you guys get to do some more. Um, Yeah. I'm seeing a violent night tomorrow. So I'm excited. The to, David Harbor movie. It is. I can't. Yeah, I can't. I'm very excited it. for that one. It, should, it looks like it'll be a fun time. Oh, he's so great. So I, yeah, it's a perfect role for him. I can't mm-hmm. wait to see that. But you're lucky getting out to see all that stuff. I am so out of the loop when it comes to that. Or oh, they don't do anything on the East Coast. I'll tell you, it's like really, it is a dead zone. If I mean, every now and then you'll get a press screening, you know, in Boston or something. And I, I've been to a a handful but there's nothing going on here there's no creators like hosting a screening and you know working with the studio it's <clears throat> there's a little bit of new york city i guess but like it's tough the whole like boston new england market just it's a dead zone up here so i try to do as much as i can remotely um, yeah that's surprising I, I really would have thought that they would have people sort of like in that area who they could rely on to do that sort of stuff i mean Hey, maybe it's, maybe it's my fault. Maybe it's up to me to try to try to do things like that. Carve out that little niche for yourself even further. Why not? You're already doing it. I mean, I'd love to, for people around here, you know, if if we can grow the audience enough, it'd be cool. But Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just a dead zone out here. So, um, 
I'm happy it's starting to shift though. And, you know, maybe that does, maybe it does start to shift out here too. Everything's got to happen out, you know, in the, in the hubs first and then mm-hmm. it'll hit everybody else. So, true, 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 true. Super cool though. I hope you guys, uh, I hope you guys hit it soon. I hope Thanks, I hit man. it soon. You too. We can, uh, we can share stories about how soon our plaques come in when we finally hit it. Um, because yeah, it's been a long time coming and it's definitely a grind. People ask me all the time, like, if I start a YouTube channel, like, what should I do? How am I going to grow it? And I'm just like, you just grind for years yeah. and years and you just be consistent. And if you're authentic enough, like you'll find an audience, but mm-hmm. not everyone's Mr. Beast. So don't expect that. Like it's yep. the, the vast majority of YouTube channels have under a thousand subscribers. Mm-hmm. And there's some really fun little niche communities in there, but like, we're not all getting famous out here. Right. Exactly. <laughs> We're trying. We're just having fun and building a community. And I think that's the, that's the best part of it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, anything else you want to plug before we go? I really appreciate you, you coming on and having this conversation. It's been great. Yeah, no, I super appreciate this. This was a lot of fun. I, I don't get too much of an opportunity to talk to people like this about physical media because you know, as much as, you know, despite living in Los Angeles there, um, most people do lean digitally heavily. So yeah. my physical media little group is very, very small. Um, so this is so cool to be able to actually like have a place to, to, to talk about this out loud. And, um, yeah, it's really great. So thank you so much for having me. I'm, I was really excited to do this actually, cause I know I, I found your stuff on TikTok originally, and then I didn't know that you had a YouTube channel. Yep. So it was cool to then go over there and see like, oh, man, we're actually like really close to hitting 100,000. <laughs> this will be a lot of fun. This will be something that we can definitely bond over the struggle to 100K. <sighs> the grind. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. No, the YouTube's TikTok was fun. It Honestly, it it's a it's a bit of a trend thing. I I did it and then I found the time I was spending on it just wasn't it wasn't worth what I was getting out of spending the same time on YouTube. So I've kind yeah. of went back to focus on, on YouTube. Not that I ever took focus off, but like YouTube's definitely still the primary. If you're a creator, even if you blow up on TikTok, I would say get yourself over to YouTube because yeah. it's the spot. Like For ask, sure. those, ask the people who are very famous on Vine, how they're doing right now. If they didn't move to YouTube or another platform. Yep. It's yeah. true. Not Amen. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I appreciate it. And anytime you want to talk, I mean, I'd love to, to hop on with you guys too. If you ever For go sure. dive into physical, I'm available. That's, uh, that's all I do. I mean, I love movies too. Obviously you can't do this without loving movies. So I'm happy to just, to just talk movies and you know, all that stuff too. But yeah, physical yeah, absolutely. passion. So we'll, uh, we'll definitely stay in touch and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do something else together. I'm sure this is, this is a really good conversation. So yeah, man, thank you. Much thank you. This was so fun. Thank you so much for having me on. All right, everyone. So that was our interview with Adam Plavik. I want to thank Adam again for coming on to the podcast, taking time out of his day to chat about a lot of different topics. It was a really, really good conversation. So appreciate him coming on and definitely make sure you check out all of his links, I'll put those in the description of the uh, Spotify or Apple podcast episode details. You can find it there. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find it in the video description. So definitely check him out and check out the YouTube channel that he works on, Heroes Reforged, because just like mine, they're getting super close to 100K. So let's go over there, go support them, help their re- help them reach their goals because I know they'd really appreciate it. But uh, that's it for this episode. Next week, I don't don't think I'm going to have a guest. I'm going to do another sort of uh, long form episode by myself, and then we'll get back and do some guests for the next several episodes. Although with Thanksgiving, with the holidays, it, it is going to be tough to line some guests up. Um, I am going to still try to get one of these out every week through the next few weeks. Um, but some of the episodes may just be me talking about topics. And I, you know, I think I'm maybe going to have some returning guests. We'll, we'll see what happens, but stay tuned for all that. If you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. And if you're on Spotify, Apple, wherever you're listening to the podcasts, make sure you follow along there. And if you enjoy it, please leave us a five-star review. I'd really appreciate that. So thank you everyone for watching and or listening. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Stay safe and stay healthy out there. And I'll talk to you all soon. Coming soon.
Be sure to subscribe to the Films at Home podcast using your favorite app so you don't miss another episode. And while you're there, don't forget to rate and review this podcast, which helps us out tremendously. You can also help support us by watching our short-form content over on YouTube and TikTok by searching Films at Home. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at films underscore at underscore home. The intro and outro were created by Elon Osborne. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.